Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we'll be recording this workshop and we will email it to those who have registered. Uh, my name is Kevin Gunn. I am the coordinator of digital scholarship and I'm joined by Charles Gallagher, reference and instruction librarian at Catholic University of America Libraries. Uh, today, we are presenting on best practices for creating, displaying and understanding visual data. Let's get started. So what we're going to look at today is we're going to do an overview of data visualization, basically the components for bringing together a good data visual. We're going to then look at types of data. So the type of data that you have will determine the visual you should use. And then we'll look at some common techniques for displaying data meaningfully. And then we'll look at limitations and misuse of common techniques. You know, what looks bad, but also the ethical dimensions to any visual. Of course, this falls under the larger concept of data literacy and how to read uh, visuals properly. So probably one of the oldest proponents of good visual display is Edward Tufte. Uh, he brought data and design together in a print format. Much of what he wrote about is still relevant today. And good design, essentially, uh, data and design uh, working uh, together. So he has this wonderful quote, oh, clutter and confusion are not attributes of data, they're uh, shortcomings of design. So do you remember the 2016 presidential election? Um, this map was created and framed uh, to demonstrate the dominance of the popular vote for Republicans. Uh, however, as many commentators have explained, um, this typical map shows geography and not people. Uh, while it is true that those large swaths of red throughout the majority of the US are correctly painted red, they are sparsely populated counties. Uh, the shape of the administrative geography drawn up, coupled with a particular sim symbol scheme, uh, creates a map where red dominates in a visual way. Uh, it's not wrong. Um, it's a particular truth. Uh, many, other, many others exist depending on how that the map is made. So could a more truthful map be positioned in the White House? Yes, of course. But again, that wouldn't speak to uh, President Trump's narrative. So if you want to look, expand out and see what you could uh, possibly visualize to get an accurate view of, uh, of the election, you could go to this particular website here by Kenneth Field. Uh, he did a number of thematic maps of the election. And this is just a screenshot of the website showing the different ways to visualize the same data with different methods that give different perceptions. So in this case, uh, a, choro a choropleth is used. It's a type of map, it's a thema thematic map that is used to represent statistical data using the color mapping symbology technique. So it displays numbers reflected in geographical areas or regions that are color shaded or patterned in relation to the data variable. So you see uh, red and blue coming together. Often we ha have the concept of purple, and that's you can see that with the chloropleth unclass blended hue in the bottom right-hand corner here, get that dimension. So I use this as an example of how you can represent um, data visually that could uh, give you a particular narrative, but not necessarily the whole truth. So what is data visualization? So it's the combination of a computer, the data, and the human being coming together. So unlike with Edward Tufte, with the uh, with unlike with Edward Tufte and his work in print, uh, with the rise of computers, you have a more robust, complex form of data visualization. Uh, being uh, cognizant of the interaction between the data, the computer, and the human being is important. You're not just creating a pretty gra graph or chart. Specifically, data acquisition, processing, and display lays the foundation so that perception, human perception, memory, and cognition uh, can be utilized. 
So looking at this data visualization framework, you have the data later with locate where you locate and obtain data, you import the data in the proper format, you relate the data for proper correspondence, you have data analysis and aggregation in this particular part. Next, you have the mapping layer, which is uh, involves associating the appropriate geometry with corresponding data channels, the data analysis and algorithms. So you start algorithms. So you start bringing that together. And then lastly, all this has to be displayed in some way. So you have the graphics layer, and that is the conversion of ge uh, geometry into displayable images, decorations, and managing interaction. And here's a wonderful chart of the human being as a processor. So I won't get into the bare details here, just to show you uh, what you have coming to what exactly it is that you are comprehending. You have your long-term memory, which is working, uh, which involves your working memory, which moves, the data moves to the cognitive processor. So you have the memory moving to the processor. You have your eyes and your ears, uh, the eye and auditory image store, and the visual image store um, coming forward into the perceptual processor and from the per perceptual processor into the cognitive processor and then into the motor processor. So along the way, along these paths, um, um, different things can happen to you. So for example, you may, um, uh, you may not, you may be colorblind in a particular way. Um, so that may uh, affect you. You may, the perception of these particular images may be different. So your, your cognitive mind may look at something very distant off in the distance, looks like it's off in the distance, but it's not really, it's very close. So you have all these sorts of dimensions of the human being that can affect uh, what goes into and what you see in a data visualization. So for example, um, let's do that. Uh, we have this particular example here of uh, you know optical illusions, and there's a lot of different things that uh, manipulate human perception. We're not getting into all of them, just as this is an example. Um, so the pixels in the photograph can play an effect on our vision. So we look at these strawberries and say, hey, they're red and that, but actually the pixels are either gray or cyan. There's no red there. It's just our mind... Uh, cognitive mind playing tricks on us. So illusions are science, but they can also be art. And if you look at any really good data visualization, it's going to combine science and art. So how appealing a visual images could be the, uh, the manipulation of your brain. So it should be noted uh, that many components of data of visualization do em employ illusions of different types and sorts. So it's something to keep in mind. So what is the value of data visualization? Uh, so it's garden exploration. So we have numbers and columns and rows. You know, uh, what story can they tell us, these numbers? You know, we have explanation. You know, we know the numbers and they possibly suggest a story to us, but we have to delve further into it. Uh, we have tons of data. How can we put it together coherently so that we uh, can explore and explain? Uh, data visualization helps us see the relationships in data that we would not otherwise see. So good data visualization will not distort. You have to ask yourself, you know, what is the motivation of the creator? You know, are they sharing something? Are they questioning something, promoting something, selling something, that sort of thing. So you always have to keep that in mind. And you also have to look at uh, audience audience expectations. You know, what does the audience need to be successful in understanding? You know, how much detail is necessary? You know, what are the cultural assumptions listed? You know, what are the colors and icons and that sort of thing? You always have to keep in mind. Another aspect of data visualization is the modes of visual visualization. So there's three main modes here, um, presentation vis visualization, interactive visualization, and interactive storytelling. So how you tell your story will depend on what mode you use. So this nice little chart uh, sets it out. 
you know, what it is that you hope to use. So in the case of presentation visualization, um, those are quite often, an example would be a poster at a conference. So it, it represents uh, images, uh, data brought together, um, but you can't really do much uh, uh, with it. Um, the graphic rendering is pre-computed rendering, so you can't do anything with it. It's targeted towards mass audience, colleagues, that sort of thing. And it could be a slideshow, you know, a static page or videos, a bunch of um, images put together into a video type thing. So nothing wrong with presentation uh, visualization. It's just a method of communication. Uh, next, you have interactive visualization. So this is where this has really taken off in the past several years where you have the user controls everything, including the data set. Um, you have real-time rendering. So as data is inputted, um, you can um, see how it, it, it can change. Um, you have the target, whether it's an individual or collaborators, and you have the medium where, where it can be uh, software or internet. Um, the third uh, one is interactive storytelling, which I guess is the gold standard, what everyone shoots for these days, if you want. So this is where the user can filter or inspect details of present data sets. So not only are uh, you can manipulate the data, but you can see what's behind it. Uh, again, the graphic, graphics rendering is real-time rendering, so you can manipulate the, the data in real time. It's targeted toward mass audience, usually a website, that sort of thing. And the medium is usually internet or possibly a kiosk, depending on where it's located. So here's a present example of a presentation visualization. And I'm going to be using the, um, the Coronas, nine, uh, Coronas, the COVID-19 um, uh, epidemic uh, visualizations that the Johns Hopkins University um, their health um, department uh, put together. Uh, so I'm using this as an example here. So here's a static page. Can't really do anything with it, but that's okay because it communicates an image. And that is, you know, where are you going likely to get COVID if you went out and talk with people? So on the left-hand side here, you have low risk. And then on the right-hand side, you have um, uh, high risk. And not only that, but you have the color from yellow, you know, um, to red, uh, red being, oh no, danger, danger. Um, and we also have the, the um, uh, circles, if you will, are getting larger as you move to the right. So there's a number of different ways that the plotting is visualizing this. Um, so you get the idea that going to a nightclub would not be a really great idea. <laughs> so here is an interactive visualization. And this is a screenshot of new confirmed COVID-19 cases back in the day. So you can do a lot of different things with this. Um, you can uh, manipulate um, the, the, the countries listed here. Let me just do this. All right, so you can manipulate uh, the data if you noticed. Um, I just did the highlight scaling listed here under the Y axis. Um, you can uh, manipulate the data source, you can manipulate, manipulate the data, the data source, the X and Y axes, and also the location. And furthermore, um, you can also animate this. So if you clicked on the animation, it would show the lines going slowly up and that sort of thing. So you can see over time uh, how things become worse. And then uh, last is the interactive storytelling one. So one can manipulate and build one's own story from the data. So here, uh, countries can be individ individually selected. Uh, you're contrasting uh, ca uh, cases with deaths. You're manipulating the axes and that sort of thing. So you can really take a look at, you know, comparing different countries, for example, and that sort of thing. Um, So the question you have to ask yourself, you know, what is data uh, or data? I say both. I just should mention that. And the Oxford English Dictionary says both ways of saying it are acceptable. I just want to say that. Um, so you have things like uh, quant quantities. You have information, graphs, measurement, observations. 
you know, facts and numbers. So it's a lot of different things coming in that gives your data visualization um, that sort of uh, uh, meaning, if you will, that story that you want to tell. So the story you're going to tell will be dependent on your data to a large extent. So this is your data and these are your data objects and actions. So how do you sort of break this data down? So you have different types of data or variables, and this is just some of the more common ones. There are many, many different types of data listed here. Here we have some of the more, uh, the ones that you'll come across uh, basically in any sort of uh, uh, data visualization. You have your, um, you have your, uh, uh, your uh, excuse me. So you have your ordinal data, which is logical sequence, you know, gold, silver, bronze, that sort of thing. You understand that there's a process there. You have categorical, so you can look at data that belongs in the same category. So if you're looking at continents, you're looking at North America, Europe, Asia. You have another one uh, called nominal data, and that's data that usually has two or more cat categories, but which do not have an intrinsic order. So shapes are be a good thing. So they're separate, but there, there's not really any order to them. Then you have discrete data that is numeric and that has a countable number of values between any two values. So uh, the number of assemblies would be an example of that. Then you have um, continuous data. So you have discrete data, which are units, if you will, and then continuous where, where, where there's an infinite number of values between any two valuables. So a continuous variable can be numeric or, or it can be data time. So for example, height would be an example of that. So um, to use an example here, um, here we have this, a night under the stars example. Um, this is a fellow by the name of Vincent examined uh, data on how people uh, stayed overnight at US parks. And you have the ordinal data listed here, where it's had, there's a logical sequence, in this case, the months uh, represented here in a circle. Uh, you have the categorical data, and that belongs in the same category. So you had four methods of accommodation. So you had uh, lodging, RVs, uh, tent, and backcountry. And then you have the quantitative data, which is like how much of something there is. So in this case, um, the temperature or how often um, um, people spent the night. So if you looked at the particular uh, table, should I say the, the key or the legend? So you have the four different types of accommodation listed here. If you look at this particular, the larger image, you'll notice it's broken down into spring, summer, fall, and winter. And the images that they have are, uh, they break it down by month as well. You'll notice that the little um, slight pink color demonstrates the average temperature. Obviously during the summer, it's gonna be much hotter. In this case, 70 degrees Fahrenheit on average. Uh, in the winter, you have white, which is usually on average below uh, 50 degrees Fahrenheit below. And then you have um, the number of nights listed here um, per month per accommodation type. So um, as, the, uh, as the circles go out from the center, the epicenter, there's more and more pe people uh, who, who've had accommodations. Made So you look at the different ways. So for example, here you have the light green tents uh, in the summer. You would expect that um, in a place um, that has four seasons um, and you have cold winter. So there's not going to be a lot of tenting going on in January, for example. So you can sort of think, you can extrapolate from this image that um, people, um, that this may be in the northern climes, um, not in the tropical area, for example, or in mountains. All right. So here's one uh, that you can take a look at here. So what can we infer from this park? Where is it from? Um, so we take a look at, we notice the lodging is the same year round. Uh, it looks like the temperature is pretty warm, 70. Uh, slightly less than that in January and March, but not below 50. So it's between 50 and 70. It's generally warm year round. 
And you'll notice a lot of people mostly do lodging and they don't do too much RV tenting or backcountry hiking type thing. So it sort of gives you a picture of what it is. And if you say, okay, where in the United States where that could be, um, possibly um, in this case, it's it's uh, the Hawaiian volcanoes uh, in Hawaii where, where you have all around decent temperature, but with a little fluctuation. So here's something that's somewhat similar. So the average temperature here is more or less the same year round. And that's an important clue. And it's hotter than 70. Ooh, I like that. Um, there is lodging and to a lesser degree are, are, are RVs, but no tent or backcountry, which suggests that the place might not be that big. Um, so why bother doing uh, overnight backcountry if the place is very small? So... This is an example from uh, the U.S. Virgin Islands. So that, again, they give you, uh, images can give you important clues about what's available out there. So here's um, a particular web, the particular website, screen, quick screenshot of the mountains. So uh, it has um, multiple locations listed here, as you can see. So here we are just in the mountains, and yet there's quite a bit of variety listed here. So there, uh, the website also gives other geographical regions such as tundra, desert, uh, tropical, uh, the coast, and also the continental Midwest. And within each of these categories, uh, the variation uh, it, it can be quite wide as well. So you, you get a sense uh, of, of the stories and what how people are camping across the United States. Now, another way to look at your data is we've all seen this, you know, data uh, dependent and independent variables. So if you're looking to create your own data visualization, this is a good place that uh, you may want to start is looking at your dependent and independent variables. So, uh, so a dependent variable is what you measure in the experiment and what is affected during the experiment. So you can't have a scientific uh, uh, experiment without a dependent variable uh, uh, without an independent and an independent variables. So an independent variable is the variable you have control over and you can choose and manipulate. So it is usually what you think will affect the dependent variable. So that's basically your hypothesis. hypothesis. So I think that independent variable will affect dependent variable by X number of degrees or whatever. So how can these be represented visually? So we go forward here. So we take a look at this chart. Uh, in this case, in the example, we're looking at stress and you know uh, how's it, if we increase stress, how does it affect our heart rate? In this create in, in this case, stress is measured by lifting of weights. Um, so if you take a look at this, you have the independent variable stress affecting the dependent variable heart rate. So you manipulate that value and that dependent variable is that, that, that which is going to be measured. And then you plot against the x-axis and the y-axis. And there you have it, a very basic as you can get um, data visualization, in this case, a line graph showing that as you add weight, people's stress goes up. So not earth shattering, but a demonstration uh, of how uh, how one can work with the data. So what are the elements in a data visualization? So you need something, you need to have the title, uh, the introduction and the citation listed. You need to have the measurements, the units, the scales and the legends. You need the methods of visual encoding. You know, how, how are they putting it all together? Then the annotations, where are they getting their source material from, their data, and that sort of thing. So, you know, it seems like kind of obvious to say this, but I believe me, when you're looking at a data visualization out there, you have to ask yourself, okay, what is it that they are, in fact, measuring? What is it that they're trying to convince you of? Is all this, all, all these elements present in that particular data visualization. And I can tell you that quite often they are not. <laughs> All right, so having said that, I'm now going to turn the presentation over to Charles who will talk about some popular types of charts.
So let Great. me just do that. I'm going to stop sharing here. There you go. Thanks, Kevin. And yeah. Okay. So there are a lot of different ways to visualize data ranging from the humble bar chart to the complex tree chart. We will highlight a few of the more common types of charts and why someone may use them. Our list includes bar charts, line charts, pie charts, scatter plots, nat charts, and tables. So bar charts. When you want to compare and rank different forms of data, you may consider using a bar chart. You can set your independent variable on one axis and the bar length based on the dependent variable value. By the end, you should have a series of bars with varying heights based on the relationship with the dependent variable. In this example, we can see how a bar chart looks. Each of the independent variables, such as energy, transportation, waste, other, and total are listed on the x-axis, while the measurement of CO2 is labeled at intervals of 500 on the y-axis. Each of the bars represents the amount of CO2 emissions each sector generated in 2006 and 2014. Looking at this chart, the user can quickly learn which sector has achieved the largest reduction in CO2 emissions, and also see that the total emissions from all sectors has decreased over the eight year period. Line charts are useful if you're trying to show how a variable changes over time. The X axis often shows the increasing change in time, which serves as the independent variable, while the Y axis shows how the dependent variable's value changes over time. Our line chart example, titled Global Surface Temperature, shows different government agencies' measurement of global temperature over a 150-year period. As you can see, each line represents an agency's measurement of temperature. As the timeline increases year after year, the temperature rises and lowers in response. From the direction of the line chart, we might conclude that the global temperature has generally been trending upwards over the past 150 years. Pie charts show a proportion of a whole. Each segment represents a proportion of a total, be it a line item in a budget or the percentage of a sample population that likes mint chocolate ice cream. In our pie chart example, we can see the different types of deferred maintenance at the Mount Rainier National Park. By looking at the data as a pie chart, we can easily see that paved and unpaved roads make up the highest percentage of deferred maintenance. Be aware, you should only use pie charts when the difference between each segment is obvious. As a rule, humans are poor judgments of angles and having like-sized segments can inhibit your reader's understanding. Consider another type of chart instead if the segment sizes are not obviously different. The goal of a scatter plot is to place data points between two variables. You can identify clusters and trends, which might indicate that one of the variables has a positive or negative effect on the other variable, such as as x increases, y decreases or increases. This is sometimes called correlation. Our example scatter plot shows the weight and height of a sample of children. Each point represents the height and weight of a child. From the data presented this way, we can see a general upward trend. As height increases, weight increases, with most of the data points centering between 75 to 110 pounds and 58 to 65 inches. Nat charts can show the change in a dependent variable with the increase of an independent variable. Nat charts can be useful because it allows the creator to exhibit differences from both position and length. This kind of chart can be used specifically when dealing with a multi-phase project where the audience wants to know how long a phase of the project lasted. In this example of a net chart, we can see the number of days each phase took and how long it took to complete the entire project. Tables are a simpler way of conveying important data. 
Tables are useful when having a numerical representation is the easiest method of presenting your information. You can set independent variables on the horizontal and the vertical sides of a table, and then plot the data in relation to the two variables. However, instead of just listing numbers, you may consider using images to represent the change in amounts, as we can see with the following example, where the different colored Smarties represent the number of Smarties in the sample size. Some concepts to keep in mind when you are considering a data visualization project. One, know what your data is saying. It seems basic, but bear in mind the type of data that you are presenting will determine the type of visual you will go with. Are you trying to show change over time? Are you trying to compare two different products? Or are you trying to show how much of your budget has been spent on pink flamingo statues? Knowing your data will help you make the right decision. Number two, know what your audience needs to hear. You will likely know the kind of people who you'll be presenting to and what is most important to them. More than that, you should consider what your audience really wants to hear. Your coworkers may need a chart to track how long it took them to complete a project. Your clients might need a chart to understand how price trends on a given product have been increasing or decreasing over the last six months. Knowing what your audience is focused on can help you figure out the best chart to use. And finally, number three, know what you really want to say. Share your insights into the data. What do you think is important to let your audience know beyond what they are initially seeking? Answer their requests and provide your own insight as well. Having worked with the data, you might have an insight the rest of your team is unaware of. Interested in data visualization but unsure of how to start? Check out the data visualization catalog. This website contains information about different types of charts and graphs that you can use. Clicking on one of the icons will bring up basic information on the chart style and examples of how it looks. The site also has a function categories, which link to other graphs with a similar purpose. There are also recommended similar charts, which might be useful. Finally, you can use the recommended tools to generate the visualization that you're looking for. Tools range from using coding to using Google Docs or Microsoft Word, so there are options available for all computer skill levels. Be aware that as convincing and useful as data visualizations can be, there are ways in which creators have manipulated their data and charts to mislead viewers. We'll cover some of the methods of manipulation. The first is truncated access. If we look at the bar chart on the left, we see that Library A has circulated more books than Library B and C. However, if you look at the y-axis, you can see that the access starts at 3,000 books instead of zero. This is called a truncated axis. Instead of starting at zero, the creator started at 3,000 to make it seem like the difference between the library circulation history is significantly higher. If we look at the graph on the right, however, we can see that when you start at zero, the difference between the library circulation history isn't as large. There still might be a significance to the difference, but we can now better see how much of a difference it really is. Note that as far as we know, the creator didn't lie about the circulation numbers. It's just the manner in which the graphs are presented that has misled us. Next, we have a graph with a dual axis. By dual axis, we mean using two y axis with one x axis. In this example, the creator uses one y-axis to show the correlation between walking and endurance level, and the other y-axis to show the chances of getting diabetes. When we look at this graph and see the overlapping lines and assume that there's a correlation between walking and chances of getting diabetes, given that the two axes are, are using different measurements, it would be incorrect to believe there is a correlation, and yet on first glance, it seems like there is. The creator is trying to show a correlation. They may be better off creating separate graphs and providing commentary. In our next example, we can tell that the pie chart is obviously wrong. Not only are the segments sized inappropriately, but the percentages add up to far higher than 100, which is not supposed to be the case. Pie charts should always accurately represent their segment size and add up to 100%.
limited scope. Sometimes you'll be presented with a small range of data which might distort important trends. For example, if you were to look at the current graph on US daily temperatures for just the years 1991 to 1997, you might see that there's a drop in 1993 and conclude that climate change is a hoax. However, if you look at the data from 1964 to 2013, you can see that there's a general trend of warmer years more than colder years, and the number of warmer years seems to increase as the years go by. This manipulation is called limited scope. You may draw incorrect conclusions based on how limited the data is. In this case, the creator could be clearer in how many bins are present or owned. For example, if this was being used to see how many households had trash bins, then a house which has one bin will be treated the same as a household which has nine bins. Better to be more specific with your data and show the difference. A viewer may come up with an interesting insight because the infographic is more specific. In this example, the bubble sizes are disproportionate. While 70.2 billion is a much bigger number than 16.8 billion, the bubbles are still scaled incorrectly. In the following example, we can see that the bubbles have been fixed. The 70.2 billion bubble is still way bigger than the other bubbles, but at least the proportions are now better. Both the square and the rectangle have the same area size, but there is a big difference in how they appear. When you're creating a data visual, make sure to be consistent with any shapes. Using a different shape can confuse and distort useful information. For example, how would the previous infographic look with the different bubble sizes look if one or two of them were triangles instead of circles? It would make deciphering the information a little bit harder for the viewer. As we talked about with chi parts, pie charts, humans are naturally bad at comparing angles. More than that, a graph like this isn't particularly helpful to compare the segments when there are so many. For this kind of data, the creator may have been better off putting these numbers in a table. Remember, if there are more than a couple of segments with obvious differences, a pie chart may not be helpful. So in conclusion, Data visualization can be an effective way to present data to your audience. This final visualization shows us the various parts that make up a good infographic. You need data, what you are presenting on, design to make the infographic attractive and interesting, shareability, easy for your readers to understand and pass on to others, and a story, what you're trying to say with your data. Together with these elements, you can create an amazing infographic. We hope this presentation has been helpful and encourage you to try your own data visualization projects. Are there any questions? And I'll also show you some of the sources that we used and some of the additional reading that we recommend if you ever get a chance to look into this further. All right, thank you, Charles. Uh, are there any questions? If you like, you can unmute or put in the chat. Well, I am not seeing anything. So I guess what we'll do is we'll call it a day, Charles. Okay. I just want to thank everyone for coming out. And once the recording is available, we'll send it out to everyone and that'll give you a uh, better, uh, greater time in looking at our additional readings and our source material. So thank you very much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of the day.